Good morning. Today we're going to be speaking about amniotic fluid embolism syndrome. This is an important and fortunately rare disease entity, but I wanted to take a few moments and go over with you some of the pathophysiology, how to recognize it, and how to categorize the treatments from an intensivist perspective. Fortunately, this isn't common, but in patients who have had a poor outcome after delivery, it's unfortunately more common than one might think. I'm going to go over the clinical presentation, the pathophysiology, and the management. So there's a classic triad of amniotic fluid embolism of hypotension, hypoxia, and coagulopathy. And so I wanted to spend a few moments to share with you how the underlying pathophysiology, the understanding of the pathophysiology, really has changed over the past decade or so, that this entity really is more along the lines of an anaphylactoid reaction or a septic shock syndrome rather than a pulmonary embolism per se. When a patient presents with this, there is an important differential diagnosis to go over, but really this differential diagnosis is the differential diagnosis of shock, and I'd like to spend a few moments on it, but this can happen during pregnancy, during delivery, immediately prior to delivery, and you can see that your patient is presenting with symptoms of shock and respiratory failure and hypoxemia. So for example, pulmonary thromboembolism, a transfusion reaction, bleeding, anaphylaxis, an air embolism, myocardial infarction, and as you can see here, septic shock. Distinguishing amongst these various entities can be difficult. It's important clearly to quickly rule out that the patient is bleeding, and this can be done in the operating room or the delivery room. But once that's been quickly ruled out, one is left with the small diagnosis of amniotic fluid embolism. So it used to be felt, and this disease was initially described in the late 20s, that it had to do with amniotic fluid getting into the maternal circulation into the pulmonary artery. But really, as they've done more and more analysis and research, as I mentioned previously, it's felt to be some sort of response to antigens in the amniotic fluid that cause a syndrome very similar to septic shock in terms of it's a distributive form of shock, it's a systemic global reaction to these antigens rather than a mechanical issue related to the amniotic fluid per se entering into the pulmonary artery. And I'd like to take a, a few moments here to go over some of the recent thoughts. So they felt feel th that there is disruption of the maternal fetal barrier during delivery, that this fetal antigen enters into the maternal circulation, and then importantly a SERS-like activation of pre-inflammatory mediators occurs, and this is very, very similar to the current thinking of what happens during severe sepsis syndrome and septic shock. You can develop severe uh, hypoxemia, again, in an analogous fashion to the development of ARDS, where you have pro-inflammatory mediators that can uh, cause destruction and damage to the alveolar endothelium. And you also develop this, in a very analogous fashion, a syndrome of activation of the coagulation cascade and disseminated intravascular coagulopathy. In terms of the cardiovascular failure, it is felt that there is initial right-sided failure. Uh, it's felt that there's initial right-sided failure, and then in survivors, subsequent left-sided failure. And the management here is primarily aggressive supportive care, um, but with the change from right-sided to left-sided failure, it is important to keep in mind that when you're assessing volume status to not over-resuscitate a patient who may be in shock. Again, distinguishing between venous thromboembolic disease and amniotic fluid embolism can be crucial because in one, it would be important 
to treat the patient for the DVT PE with anticoagulation and the other you wouldn't want to give anticoagulation at all. This is obviously a big challenge as evaluations often need to be done emergently in a patient who may be presenting with cardiopulmonary arrest and the use of transesophageal and transthoracic echo may be helpful, but unfortunately, given the fact that both can present with acute right-sided dysfunction, this can be a very, very difficult decision to make. The management of amniotic fluid embolism syndrome really is one of aggressive supportive care. I think that once the initial diagnosis has been made, it's important to understand that in the literature, the prognosis can be extremely guarded, but it is important early on to be very aggressive, and by that I mean if the patient is developing worsening ARDS or severe cardiovascular failure, that thoughts of extracorporeal life support are given, if that can be done at your center or if that may require transfer to another center. The focus here is on aggressive supportive care early on while the body recovers. But again, the prognosis can be extremely poor with mortality rates 70, 80 percent, especially if patients initially present with cardiopulmonary arrest. And as I was mentioning previously, the prognosis can be somewhat guarded, but I believe that this will change as extracorporeal life support changes uh, the ability to provide support for both the heart and the lungs in these kinds of situations. One of the biggest problems is patients who develop neurological dysfunction from the cardiopulmonary arrest itself, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And again, this can happen so quickly that there isn't anything to be done about it. So in conclusion, I wanted to mention this clinical disease entity, amniotic fluid embolism. The th underlying thought from a medical student resident perspective is to think about this in a patient who uh, is in the peripartum situation, may just have given birth, maybe in the process of giving birth, who suddenly presents with cardiovascular collapse and that the triad of coagulopathy, cardiovascular dysfunction, uh, and hypoxemia really should make one think about amniotic fluid embolism syndrome, quickly ruling out the other causes of shock, such as a peripartum cardiomyopathy, such as an actual pulmonary embolism from venous thromboembolic disease, um, a primary myocardial event, and of course bleeding. Once that's ruled out, aggressively getting the patient into an intensive care unit, having a synergistic approach, working closely with critical care, maternal fetal medicine, and OBGYN to get the patient through the initial phase where there will be right-sided dysfunction, then subsequent left-sided dysfunction, managing the patient through the hypoxemia and the cardiovascular failure. Again, as I've mentioned in previous videos, the cardiovascular support requiring inotropes and vasopressors is very analogous to the management of patient with sepsis where drugs like norepinephrine would be utilized and then if additional inotropes may be required, drugs like such as dobutamine or considering milrinone if the hemodynamics allow it. We hope you found this video to be helpful. Thanks again for watching.